We'll go ahead and stand for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The act of faith, O oh my God, I firmly believe that thou art one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I believe that thy divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because thou hast revealed them, who canst neither deceive nor be deceived. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saints Peter and Paul, Pray for us. eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. And and the the May his soul and the souls of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Amen. All right, please be seated. So, it has been, I think, four weeks since our last class before Christmas with all of the ceremonies for Christmas, Epiphany, etc. So now I hope to get back to the uh, twice a month schedule. So our next class will be then two weeks from today, which I believe is February 1st. So we begin with a short review. Last class, we finished the, uh, what are sometimes referred to as the Christological heresies, which means the heresies that have to do with Christ and our understanding of who he is. That Jesus Christ, of course, is one person with two natures. And all the different heresies, the Arianism, Nestorianism, Eutychianism, and then the last um, heresy that we had was monothelitism. And monothelitism monothelitism I'm missing an L it's big words has to do it means one will monothelitism and that was the heresy that really led to a lot of controversy uh, with Pope Honorius who was later condemned in a council because he had not forthrightly condemned the heresy. He wasn't a heretic himself. He didn't promote it, but he just failed to condemn it strongly. But that was the name of the heresy, monothelitism, which taught that there was only one will in Christ. So in effect, it denied the human will of Christ. So that was, that was condemned in the, I think, the early 600s. So we're going to take up from the um, early 600s and the first thing I want to mention today is the Muslim religion. Now, uh, th this is not so much a heresy. I mean, it contains heretical ideas, such as they do reject the Trinity, believe in only one God and one person. But um, it's important to understand because it affected the so the church so much and has continued to affect the church and society. So it started in, I think the year was 610, early 600s, when Mohammed began to um, teach his, his ideas and he uh, was driven out of Mecca, had to escape, or Medina, one or the other, was driven out and then eventually gathered an army, convinced enough people of his religion gathered an army and then went back in triumph and and over the course of about a century the Mohammedans the Muslims uh, Islam they literally conquered within about a hundred years much of the east and especially the southern Mediterranean so the northern part of Africa but um, Mohammed taught polygamy and he had a very sensual idea of heaven promised extraordinary pleasure, etc., did not have the spiritual concept. And he got his religion, he had been a trader and traveling on caravan routes, etc., and he met 
encountered Christians and Jews and pagans. And so he developed this religion, which was a mixture of ideas from these different uh, other religions. So the Muslim religion, well, he gave it the, the name Islam, and it um, became quite successful in subjugating large numbers of people. Now, the next heresy that we're going to come to is the iconoclast heresy, or we'll call it iconoclasm. And you know what an icon is in the Eastern rites they have holy pictures that they refer to as icons. And so iconoclasm was the idea of breaking the pictures, the images, destroying them, and forbidding the use of, of images. So I'm going to read a little bit here from a history book regarding iconoclasm. The religious use of pictures and images common since the catacomb days had always been favored in the Eastern Church. But now the conspicuous place that images occupied in the daily life of the people aroused strong disapproval on the part of several groups. The monks were very much in favor of the use of images and supported it. But against them were arrayed some heretics called the Politians, the Jews, and the Moslems, and eventually the emperor. So there, there was this dispute in the East regarding the use of images. Thus it happened that a controversy, which at the beginning seemed to be of no particular importance, developed into a struggle of the first magnitude between church and state. Because you had the emperor, Leo the Asarian, who was opposed to the use of images, and then you had the monks, many of whom were driven away, went into exile uh, because of the fury with which this emperor uh, objected to the use of images. Leo the Asarian was hostile to the monks and friendly to the iconoclasts, and perhaps he also believed that the Christian practice of venerating images was hindering the conversion of Jews and Muslims. Possibly, too, he aimed at the suppression of current extravagant customs. In any event, in the year 726, he published an edict declaring the use of images to be idolatrous and forbidden by divine law. And he ordered the removal of all images from the churches. St. Germanus, Patriarch of Constantinople, the Bishop of Constantinople, who pro uh, protested against the edict, was deposed by the emperor, who put a man of his own choice in his place. So we could date at least the beginning of the real uh, controversy here. It had existed before, but really was full-blown in the year 726. And it'll come up again, I think, in the 800s or 900s, so uh, iconoclasm. Um, so St. Germanus was deposed in 732. When the imperial edicts from Leo, the Asarian, arrived in Rome, the Pope condemned them. Pope Gregory II protested against this imperial edict. The next Pope, Gregory III, in a synod attended by more than 90 bishops, affirmed that the veneration of images was authorized by Catholic tradition. And in 754, the Emperor Constantine V continued the practice of his father, convoked an assembly of 340 bishops, and condemned the use of images. So here you have this, you know, this controversy going on. And there were these groups that would go and destroy images that they could find. And there were a lot of martyrs. As a matter of fact, uh, St. John Damascene, who I think died around the year 750, 754, I believe. St. John Damascene had his right hand cut off because of his writing in defense of the images. And our Blessed Mother miraculously healed him. An interesting story. But there were a number of monks and Catholics put to death or uh, tortured because of their support of the use of images. So we need to talk about that for a minute 
uh, in a catechism, you will have um, a discussion of the use of images and the, the permission to use images, uh, usually under the first commandment. Because, of course, the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. And if you go back to the book of Exodus and you read the entire first commandment, it's thou shalt not have any graven images, nor shalt thou adore them. And so the, the idea is the adoration, the idolatry of, of an image. But the use of images has been in the Catholic Church since the time of the catacombs, where you can find images painted on the walls of the catacombs. And it has always, always existed. We know that Protestants have a difficulty with our practice of having statues and pictures, as though it's a violation of the first commandment. And it gives us the opportunity to explain to them, we don't adore these images, but they serve to remind us, since we are affected by our vision, by our senses, they remind us of the persons to whom we are praying, whom we are honoring. Um, and th this has been, you know, as a result of this whole controversy, the proper use of images was defined. But one interesting thing you can say to non-Catholics who object to the use of images, well, if God meant that there should be no images at all for any reason, if you took it literally, it would forbid the use of spoons and cups and plates, etc. Anything, and the graven means just, just made out of, out of metal. But what about, the, um, what about the brazen serpent? Brazen means it was made out of bronze. So God commanded Moses to have this image made and to be put up on a staff in the middle of the camp. This is before the Hebrews entered the promised land during that 40 years wandering in the desert and they were rebelling against God and so a plague of poisonous serpents came into the camp and if somebody got bit by these serpents they would die within a short time and so then the people went to Moses and were repentant of their rebellion against God Moses went and prayed and God told him to make this image of a serpent out of bronze on a staff to raise it up high in the camp and that if anybody got bit he would just have to look at the image and he would be immediately cured and our Lord himself used that as a type of his own crucifixion being raised up on the cross for the salvation of the world so we find that in St. John's Gospel our Lord referring to that but the point is if God had meant that there were to be no images whatsoever why would he then have commanded Moses to have that image made? So what was forbidden is the worship, like the golden calf, the worship of images. So um, there was this, you know, this persecution lasted for years. In 787, this is when it really started, so look at that, 61 years later. In 787, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which was held in Nicaea, the Second Council in Nicaea, convoked with the approval of the Pope and the aid of the Empress, defined the Catholic doctrine, making clear the distinction between the adoration due to God and the veneration given to the saints, and also explaining that the veneration of an image is really an act of homage offered not to the inanimate object, but to the person that it represents. So that is briefly um, a, a heresy because it was a heresy it denied the uh, lawful use of images and um, there was a council of the church that, that again here explained or uh, the proper use of images etc so this we're going to keep in mind is so to speak the beginning of a break a schism between the East and the West. And the second point that really brought about this schism was the, um, was the controversy over the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But before we go into that, 
I want to talk about a man named Phocius. So, this marker looks like it's about out of ink. Let me get another one. Now, before we go into Phocius, P H O T I U S, who became Patriarch of Constantinople, um, an emperor put him in there without the Pope's approval. But before we get into that, we should talk about the fact that the Roman Empire, and this is going back to like the late 200s, the Roman Empire became so great and so large, so many people, such a sphere of activity and geographic area that it covered, that it was decided that there should be two emperors, one in the east and one in the west. In the west, the emperor was in Rome, or sometimes somewhere else in Italy, like Ravenna. The emperor resided in Ravenna for a while. But there was an emperor in the west, in Rome, and then there was an emperor in the east. So that's why, like even before Constantine, you read about Maxentius and Diocletian, for example. So two different emperors, one kind of dealing with affairs in the west and one in the east. Um, and then it came to Constantine, now, Constantine became the sole emperor in the year 312. So he, there wasn't an Eastern, or for the time being, there wasn't. He became the sole emperor. And I think later he had uh, appointed someone else as emperor. But Constantine didn't really like Rome in Italy. And he went to the East, and he set up his... Um, palace and court in this what was a tiny town on the strait uh, the Bosphorus I think it's called but it's where the kind of the Black Sea and Caspian Sea I don't remember all my geography flows into the Mediterranean and it's now in the country of Turkey and it's now called Istanbul but at the time Constantine built it up he named it after himself so it was called Constantinople and that's where the emperor in the east then lived for the next 700 years or more, more than 700 years. Constantinople. It was a, a city and became a great city. So here you had the pope in the, in the west in Rome and you had a bishop in Constantinople who was called a patriarch because he was over other bishops, very influential. Well, over time, what was happening is there were more and more differences between the East and the West. And even a resentment on the part of many Catholics in the East that the head of the church should reside in Rome. And the Church of Rome was referred to as the Latin Church. And the Eastern Rites were referred to as the Greek Church. But over time, there came to be more and more of a drifting apart, I guess you might say. And the, this led to a schism, which was at first short-lived, and that was under this man named Phocius. So we will we'll refer to this as the Eastern Schism. So, meaning the break, schism is a break between the East and the West. So, I just want to read a little bit about it. So, in 842, the emperor was Michael III, the emperor of the East, of Constantinople. And as a result of the iconoclast dispute, ecclesiastical leaders had split into two factions one of which excluded from office all bishops who had been iconoclasts, whereas the other advocated the restoration of repentant prelates to their old positions. On the strength of serious charges against the morals of a certain Bardas, uh, I don't know all about him, the patriarch Ignatius refused to admit him to communion. 
so whoever he was, this man. So the patriarch, meaning the bishop of Constantinople, was a man named Ignatius. This is in the mid-800s, okay? Thereupon, Ignatius was deposed by Michael III, the emperor. So the emperor said, you can't, Bardas is a friend of mine, you can't be bishop any longer. He deposed him, and he made Phocius the bishop of Constantinople, the patriarch of Constantinople. And Phocius had been a layman, but, but he was put in that position by uh, the emperor in 857. These events evoked a vigorous action on the part of Pope Nicholas I, who in a Roman synod in 863 excommunicated Phocius and also requested the patriarchs of the East to repudiate him. Thereupon the Emperor Michael, Michael III of Constantinople, convened a synod which pronounced sentence of deposition and excommunication of the Pope. So this is what you have going on. And again, it was it was more church versus state. It was Leo, I'm sorry, it was Michael the third wanting to be able to control everything. And he liked this man, Phocius. So um, this led to a short-lived schism. Uh, I'll just read a little bit more. So they, they pretended to excommunicate the Pope, and Michael went so far as to promise the Western Emperor whose name was Louis II, Emperor of the West, uh, to promise him official recognition of his imperial title if he would execute the sentence against the Pope of excommunication. When Basil the Macedonian came to the throne, so now we're back to Constantinople, a new emperor came and he deposed Phocius and you know, resolved, resolved this schism and he restored Ignatius. And the Eighth Ecumenical Council in 869 endorsed both actions. Despite support he had received from the Pope, Ignatius helped to win Bulgaria away from patriarchal jurisdiction of Rome, and, uh, and then the Pope died. Phocius then became patriarch. This time, the Holy See tolerated it, allowed it. So he ended up becoming patriarch lawfully, but then a new emperor didn't like him and deposed him and put him in prison and he died in prison. But the point is, we're talking about the latter 800s. So, so this started, Phocius started in 857 as, um, as this usurper in, as bishop of Constantinople and then was deposed and then was allowed back and uh, died, I think, in the 870s. So the point here is this was a short-lived schism between the East and the West, but it was a harbinger of a lasting schism, which came about in 1054. So that's what we want to talk about next, because then it has persisted to this day, the schism of 1054. So that's the year that's given for the final break between the East and the West. Um, again, there were the, the various differences between the East and the West that, that kind of precipitated the difference in language, you know, Latin versus Greek, and so on and so forth. Um, a dispute arose in the 900s over the failure of the Eastern Church to teach the procession of the Holy Ghost from both the Father and the Son. A council held near Soissons in France in the year 909 proclaimed that the Holy Spirit proceeds both from the Father and the Son and classified the denial of this doctrine as a blasphemous error of the Greeks. Some 90 years later, by way of retaliation, the Patriarch of Constantinople struck out the name of the Pope from the diptychs, which would be, which would be like the commemoration of different persons during the Mass. Uh, so, I want to take a minute before we finish leading up to the schism and what what the circumstances were. I want to take a minute to talk about the. Um, the teaching of the church on the procession of persons in the Trinity. 
Now for us, this is, this is something very deep. Theologians discuss and, and try to understand. But we know from scripture and from the teaching of the church that the father begets the son. God the Son. And the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And when this was was being taught, many in the East objected to that and said this is something new that the that Rome is coming up with and it's wrong. And that's what at least was the justification that led to the final break with the East between Rome and Constantinople, the final schism. And to this day, any church that is referred to as Orthodox, you have Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, uh, Armenian, whatever, Orthodox, that means they do not accept the papacy. They've been split from the Catholic Church ever since 1054 from that union. And uh, some of these rites, because you know there are Eastern rites where their mass is different, like you know when I was young, there was a period of time where we went, my family went to the Byzantine mass, and it was in Greek. But it uniate, Byzantine uniates, which means they accepted the Pope, they were in union with. But that same mass, which was referred to as the mass of St. John Chrysostom, is offered by the Greek Orthodox. So they have valid orders, they have retained valid orders and their own customs, but they reject the papacy. And there are other uh, heresies among the Orthodox, which we'll get to a little later, today or else next class. But I want to talk about this. So you know that at the Council of Nicaea, which condemned Arius in 325, that they came up with a creed. Now we have the Nicene Creed. The word Nicene means it was put together by the bishops at Nicaea in 325. But the Nicene Creed has been modified twice. So uh, in the 300s, there was an, a heresy known as Macedonianism. We, we talked about that before. But Macedonius, Macedonius denied that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father. And so because of that, because of that denial, I'm just writing this up here, proceeds from the Father. Because of that denial, in 381, so again, Council of Nicaea, 325, wrote the Nicene Creed, and it was added to in 381 by a council in Constantinople, the Council of Constantinople, the first Council of Constantinople. Now, this is the part, we read the creed every Sunday, right after the gospel or after the sermon, and on certain feast days, there is a creed at Mass. And it's not the Apostles' Creed that we say at the beginning of the Rosary, but the Nicene Creed. And we say the second part of the Creed has this, these words, And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. Now, this creed, these words were added uh, in 381 by the Council of Constantinople. But it put the Holy Ghost, because it was correcting the heir of Macedonius, it just put the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father, who proceeds from the Father. And then later, a council in Toledo, Spain, in, I got the, year here somewhere, but the Council of Toledo then added and the Son. Now the Latin word for and from the Son is filioque. One word was added 
and that really led to this big rupture because these bishops in the East were saying, oh, you've added something, and that's not true. And so to this day, the Orthodox deny that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. They teach the Holy Ghost proceeds only from the Father. Now, what, what is this all about, this procession of persons? It's what we would call the inner life of the Trinity. So we know that God had no beginning, will have no end, he is eternal, and there is this mysterious life that goes on in the Trinity. The Father begetting the Son, the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son, and all three persons are eternal, all three persons are consubstantial, and no one person is over the other, just because the Father is not begotten, nor does he proceed. And I sometimes show this to students when we're, you know, we're teaching this in, in uh, catechism class. A lot of times a, an equilateral triangle is used to demonstrate the Trinity because it has three angles, three sides, and all are equal, right? So if we say this is the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, we use that. The Father begets the Son, and the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. So it's a very, very simple diagram with these arrows to show what we call the procession of persons. The Father begets the Son, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. So as I mentioned to you, to this day, the Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, all the Orthodox, they deny that the Holy Ghost also proceeds from the Son, filioque, and from the Son. That's a Latin word, which means and from the Son. So how would you answer that? Well, I want to give you a couple quotes from Scripture. Here is in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16. And now I, and this is Jesus speaking to his apostles at the Last Supper. And now I am going to him who sent me. And no one of you asks me, where art thou going? But because I have spoken to you these things, these things, sorrow has filled your heart. But I speak the truth to you. It is expedient for you that I depart. For if I do not go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I will send him. This is Jesus speaking. God the Son, right? I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of justice and of judgment, etc. And on other occasions, he refers, Jesus, refers to the Holy Ghost as proceeding from the Father. Here's another quote from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel. When the Advocate has come, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness concerning me. Now notice in that, that short sentence, our Lord is saying two things primarily in, in this regard. He's saying, when I go, I will send him to you, whom I will send you from the Father. So I will send, and then he goes on to say, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father. So the Catholic Church has always taught the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. But when the Council of Toledo added those words to the Nicene Creed and from the Son, even added that one word, then there was a, you know, a big um, disagreement. That was in 589 that those words were added, the filioque. And finally, uh, we have a, the 14th Ecumenical Council, which the Second Council of Lyon, you know, Lyon is in southern France. In 1274, the Second Council of Lyon decreed, quote, we confess that the Holy Ghost proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son, not as from two principles, but as from one principle, not by two spirations, but by one single spiration, breathing forth. So that's just a, you know, quoting from a council of the church and the faith of the church is the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father, filioque, and from the Son. But that was used as the main sticking point in the East to have this break with Rome. So let me read a little bit more about the details, and this is what, where we'll end for today. The 
Schism of 1054 was the tragic outcome of numerous and ancient differences between the Greek Church and the Holy See. Michael Cerularius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, without raising any strictly theological issue, built up a quarrel with the Pope out of protests against the eating of certain things, the custom of fasting on Saturday, the omission of Alleluia during Lent, which is done in the Latin Church, the Roman Church, but not in the East, um, and, and the use of unleavened bread, etc. You know, in the Eastern Rites, they use leavened bread. But the Western Rite, the Latin Rite, has always used unleavened bread. So there are all these little differences. And this man, Michael Cerularius, was a bishop, I, I erased it, but we had it up here earlier, the city Constantinople, okay? So he was the bishop of Constantinople, Michael Cerularius. And I don't know if I'll spell this word correctly, Cerularius. I think that's A-E, you know, Greek. Michael Cerularius. So he was the bishop or patriarch of Constantinople who at first was raising objections against the Latin rite, against the Pope, over minor things or practices, different customs, and so forth. So that, that's how it began. Uh, and he wrote a list of 33 distinct objections. On the strength of these, he decreed the closing of the Latin churches in Constantinople. Pope Leo IX, sent Cardinal Frederick, the future Pope Stephen X, and Cardinal Humbert to negotiate with Serularius. Their efforts were ineffective, and on July 16th, 1054, they entered the church of Santa Sofia as service was about to begin and laid upon the altar a papal bull excommunicating Michael Serularius and two other Eastern bishops. Michael, in turn, pretended to excommunicate the Pope, and that was the break. So if you were to date it, July 16th, 1054, a very sad day in the history of the church. But again, it began with more, there was a sentiment in the East that because Christianity began in the East, namely in the Holy Land, that the Patriarch of Constantinople should really be the Pope or should have authority over the Pope or at least equal authority. So there was a, more of a resentment of the position of the Pope as the successor of St. Peter and therefore the Vicar of Christ on earth and so forth. So to this day, um, the Orthodox reject the papacy and of course they reject infallibility. When I say they reject the papacy, that means the authority, uh, the primacy of the Pope over all the other bishops in the world, his authority. And they reject infallibility because it was taught at Vatican Council I in 1870. They also reject the Orthodox. They reject the Immaculate Conception. And the reason why they reject the Immaculate Conception is because it was solemnly defined by a pope. Uh, and one other thing, and there are, there are other differences, but one other thing that's interesting is they allow divorce and remarriage, the Greeks, the, the Greek Orthodox, that is. They allow divorce and remarriage. Now, I'm not talking about an annulment. We're talking about a couple validly married, and they acknowledge they were validly married, but they want a divorce and then remarry, and they allow that in the Greek Orthodox Church. So those are some of the main differences. But this idea of the Holy Ghost proceeding from the Father and the Son became the... Uh, argument, the primary argument that they used for disagreeing with um, with the Pope and with the you know the Roman Catholic Church, the Latin Church as it was sometimes called. So, so that in some total is uh, it's a schism, meaning a break from the unity, from the authority of the Pope, but it also includes heretical ideas like this denying that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. And I just gave you two quotes from our Lord's words recorded by St. John, the Holy Ghost whom I will send you from the Father. And again, whom I will send. 
So pretty clear right there. And again, the Catholic Church has always taught it. And there were even Eastern bishops who taught that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. But when it, when it became that they needed a justification, I, I guess you might say, then this came up again, what had come up before. So that's it for today, and we're up to now about the 10 hundreds, and we're going to proceed next class in two weeks to some of the heresies uh, in the several centuries leading up to Protestantism.